Thursday, have a good day, and I want to come to you, um, what is a, a Borders and Bodies research seminar um, in the School of Modern Languages. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome Seattle based artist uh, Akiva Segan um, and our very own Mark Schweisinger, who's going to talk, uh, both of you are going to be talking today. Um, and the talk is going to be divided into two parts. Um, so in the first part, um, Akiva will be presenting artworks from his Under the Wings series, um, which um, has been a work in progress since 1991. Um, Akiva is the Education Director of the International Shoah Art Museum. Um, in 2003, he began the Companion Sightseeing with Dignity Human Rights Art Series to help bridge the gap of the students between the history of World War II and intolerance, hate, hate crime attacks, and current conflicts, wars, and genocide. Um, and he describes the T series as a, a quid, restoration of dignity for the memory of those persecuted and murdered. Um, and in the second part, a German lecturer here in the School of Modern Languages, Mark Schweisinger, will introduce some uh, literary texts, um, uh, representations of the Holocaust from the perspective of the victims um, and of the perpetrators. And this kind of collaboration, you're, you're both going to be working on a, a Mark's book, I hear, um, which is also um, dealing with literary representations of the, the Holocaust. Okay, so I'll pass you over to our speakers. Thank Thanks. You. <coughs> yeah, I think we have to... with some of the works uh, interspersed. Can everyone hear me? <coughs> Thanks. So um, sh showing a small selection of artworks as um, Charlotte. Charlotte mentioned uh, from my Under the Wings series which portrays victims of the Nazi perpetrated Holocaust and several victims of um, Italian and Croatian fascism. Drawings from the Sightseeing with Dignity and Human Rights art series. I'm going to show several non- under the Wings series, Holocaust and their anti-Nazi resistors, education-focused drawings. Special thanks to Hoflet Professor Dr. Mark Weisinger, plenipotentiary, for the presentation invite. Many years ago, when I was out of graduate school and I was trying to do resume enhancement, I donated. So I was an etcher back then, and I donated several etchings to several different art museums, as we call them in the states. One of them was the uh, Albertina Graphic Arts Collection in Vienna, and I got this very uh, formal letter from some, maybe the head of the Prince Graphic Arts Division, who I don't remember his name, but it, he signed it. It was typed, you know, um, fountain pen signed, and Hofet Professor Doctor Director de Gravure or whatever, something like that. So I thought, you know, I just get called, hey, dude, you know, and I, I like the formality of. of <laughs> The Austrians and the British are really into nice formality. Uh, this is my first social justice artwork, um, 1972. I started, didn't start college until I was like two months shy of age 23. And I, I don't remember what the photograph was. It would take an intense amount of research probably to find it now. But I had seen a photograph of a Vietnamese woman with a gun against her head, similar to the very famous photograph from the Vietnam War of a Saigon police chief about to execute a Viet Cong soldier. So I did the, the drawing. This is, I just found the drawing recently in the last year or so, like with a um, marking pen and in etchings and lithography, linoleum block prints, the image comes out in reverse. So I did it like that, so it would show up like that. It was called Vietnam or Viet, that one says Vietnam Summer Special Number One. Early 1973, I, I printed the block which is about 10 by 12 inches, like five times. And I added, and when I framed it a couple of years ago, it now belongs to the university collection I went to undergraduate school. Um, I added some different things from the anti-war movement when I was in high school and beyond. The, um, 
banner. Oh, not the banner. This was an armband that I got when um, I went to a memorial march in Manhattan. I grew up in Queens, New York, where I learned to speak the proper Queens English, by the way. Keep it down, because Donald Trump is also from Queens. You don't want to have an association <laughs> there. But um, <clears throat> the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated, April 1968, I went to Manhattan by bus and subway tube, and uh, I took part in a, in a memorial march and was given this. Um, some people might think this is has to do with like Jesus Christ, but it's not. It's, it was Martin Luther King and some other uh, kind of buttons and things from the time period. Um, in, in presentations I do in uh, schools and other sites, I frequently introduce the, uh, my talks with this photograph of here. So 1968, when I was 18, Martin Luther King and then Bobby Kennedy were both assassinated. Bobby Kennedy probably would have become president. Five years earlier, when I was 13, the year I was bar mitzvah, Jewish rites and passion ceremony, um, President Kennedy was assassinated, kind of both uh, still in, in memory have big impact. You notice the two-tiered candelabra pointing up behind my head, bringing to me one of my favorite topics, um, stereotyping. And I, as I understand it, the um, impression that Jewish people have horns actually predates Christianity, goes back to ancient Rome, or so I've read Michelangelo's Moses, incredible sculpture, Alec Guinness, who I've always adored, in Oliver Twist, which came out in 1948, and it was, the release was delayed at least two years in the States because people were, there were protests about how Guinness was portrayed for the Fabian character. That's made with my all weather gear, you know, rain, snow, sleet, wind, a horn protector is there. That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> and. Um, and I, I tell the like, pupil students, um, you know, if you ever hear someone say that Jewish people have horns, you tell them that's right. They make, there's some very fine Jewish musicians, klezmer music, you know, trumpet, trombone, saxophone, and so on. When I was uh, <clears throat> out of grad school in Missouri, I moved to Seattle, where I've been ever since, Pacific Northwest. And in 1984, I had the opportunity to spend the, like six weeks in Poland, which basically changed my life. That's, made up there on the left with a guy probably was around my age at the time, um, a folk artist. The, that's me, the fellow on the right I became friends with, <coughs> he um, <coughs> grew up in, <coughs> pardon, <coughs> grew up in St. Andrews, a Scottish art student at the time. His parents were from Lvov, which was in Poland when they were growing up in Ukraine since the end of World War II. I visited Matt um, in, Scotland in Aberdeen in 85, learned about an international artist in residency at the Aberdeen Art Gallery, and two years later I spent five months in Aberdeen. And if you think I have trouble understanding people around here, I'll tell you the Aberdonian dialect and the Glaswegian dialects, I might as well uh, be in Finland or something. Can't understand anybody. <laughs> it, it gets worse as I get older. Um, the first major work after I did after my first so I was in Poland in the summers of 84 and 85. I did this one in fall of 84. Um, I had saved this New York Times magazine. I still have the whole magazine with a, an article about Elie Wiesel, photograph taken by a, a New York photographer, who's still active in New York, and I had used that as the basis for that. The work is called Elie's Sin, and I've always explained that his sin was the fact that he was born Jewish which made him targeted for death under Nazi you know, race, hate, and hygiene supremacy laws, same with the Romani and Sinti peoples. There's a saluting concentration guard tower over there. There's some language which can cause um, a bit of stir with some people. Interestingly enough, I'm gonna go on two minutes on this. It um, was in an international exhibit against racism in Vancouver, Canada, toured Canada for a year and a half and then uh, it was purchased by a progressive church in Seattle in 1999 where I was fundraising for my first trip to, teaching trip to Israel. And then it sat in the closet for six years because all these church elders and whatever um, thought it was, um, people wouldn't understand it. And I offered to do a, a, a talk about it with Sunday school children, Sunday school teachers and everyone, but it never happened. And the work's hanging up in my flat now. Um, 
jeweler, uh, a visitor a few years ago saw the work hanging up and laughed on seeing this, which inspired, I did two companion pieces for this just a few years ago, and I'll point out what, what I did uh, likewise. Um, a work I began seated in the Jewish cemetery in Corfu after I left Poland in the summer of 85. I traveled through Europe and um, photographs I took um, and I, I artified the mat around the drawing of the gravestones. There's a, um, like a hand holding a knife here, which I drew on the right. Mustaki in Hebrew, similar, some of you may be familiar with Georges Mustaki, who just died a couple of years ago, the late great French Jewish, Egyptian born, Greek Jewish descent, French singer songwriter. And the uh, hands there is from uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, Jewish um, priest blessing going back to ancient times. Photograph from World War II. Uh, Jewish people, this one weeping in a city called Ionina or something like that, uh, waiting transport. They would have been sent off to Auschwitz. Uh, everyone in this photo was a relative of my mother's, except for her. She was, I don't know her name, she was a friend of my great grandmother. They lived in the Jewish old folks home in Bialystok, Poland. I don't know their names either. The man and his son, the boy and the girl were first cousins of my mother. This guy was their dad, and he was um, a brother of my mother's father. This is the girl and the boy, uh, 2005, I think it was. I met him once, and I met her three times in trips, teaching trips to Israel. They're both gone now. So everyone was murdered except for the, these three here. And I've depicted my great grandmother in three different artworks. We'll see her in one of those. Trolleys in the Warsaw Ghetto, published 1988 in the book, The 45th Anniversary. Can you see over there, by the way? Um, 45th Anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, published by Interpress in Warsaw. And I had checked this book out of the public library once before, and then in late 91, I checked it out again. I was mesmerized by the photos. They reminded me of like film movie stills, except for the fact they weren't movie stills. They were from real life. A driver, a conductor, you told by his cap, a passenger with a star of David armband on his forearm. And I did this drawing one day. And then before the wings were drawn, it was sitting in my flat for about a week. The silence of the white space around it uh, kept on drawing me in. And I knew about a bird's wings collection at a natural history museum in Seattle. I called up, made an appointment, Spent a day drawing, I don't remember which wing I drew first. I drew one wing one day, went back another day, drew the second wing. And basically the series was born that I anticipated completing by 1993 in time for the um, 50th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Now it's 2017. I'm actually nearing completion of the series now. The second drawing was um, from this photograph. Um, the Man, his clothes not only falling apart, but disintegrating inside out. Again, wings. The first 15, 16 drawings I did were all from photographs in that one book, all black and white. And then I started doing a little bit of color, then a whole lot of color. And, um, and at some point, or also around 16 or 17, I began interspersed with drawings of people known by name. And we're, drawings I've done where we don't know who the person was, I, give, I title it by how the person looks in the photograph. This is a man with tattered coat. That's at the uh, museum there with a um, uh, ornithology department, uh, whatever, uh, assistant at the time, working on a large work. Something funny happened at the time I was wor working on this. There was a one hour photo place where I lived in Seattle. And the uh, the fellow who owned the shop um, that had made some prints for me, including like this and a couple of other black and white photos. And he asked me if this is Ayatollah Khomeini, which um, was Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran. Um, I guess that was post-revolution. Uh, and uh, but uh, it was kind of a, well, it was just a surprise and an incongruous question uh, drawn from a photograph of a man in the Warsaw Ghetto. There's the, um, 
right wing on viewer's left and the center panel as a triptych. He also didn't have a uh, prayer shawl on in the photo. I did that just for artistic license. It's called the man with talus, which is like Hebrew for the prayer shawl. Uh, the first two life-size drawings in the series, um, all India ink, um, thousands of dots, lines, dashes, gesture lines, and all that. Girl in rags in the Warsaw Ghetto, Bar Mitzvah age boy in the Warsaw Ghetto. They give you a sense of scale. Three visitors to the studio. This is around uh, 21 years ago, I guess. Alex Schwartz was a uh, someone. He and his, I became friends with him and his wife in Seattle in the 1990s. I was a library clerk for 29 years. Artists have to work at something or other, and they lived in the neighborhood district where I was working at a library branch in the 1990s. And um, she was a kinder transport survivor from Vienna, lived in England, very unhappy. She was lonely, uh, didn't have any friends, worked in a state in the countryside somewhere, but she was alive. Alex had gotten out on a visa to America um, from Vienna. And they met in New York sometime, I guess, late 1940s or early 1950s. After Trudy died, Alex moved back to Vienna after 60 years, which astonished me. And I visited him 1999 at the, it's called the Moses Maimonides Centrum Home for the Aged in Vienna. Um, and I spent like several days there on my way to my first teaching trip to Israel in 1999. So I, I don't remember what this was, and I picked it up in Vienna um, and some other kind of memorabilia. These are actually different drawings. Um, although at first glance they may look the same, but you'll see there's more drawing here than there is here. Actually, that one's ink and that was pencil. Uh, both of them are deceased now. Um, by the late 1990s, I began doing very, in the Wing series, very multiplistic, um, visually complex imagery. Uh, big change from the first 15 or to 20 drawings that were more or less singular, one, two, or three figures and wings. Uh, also have a lot of color. A uh, minister friend, retired campus minister I had met when we both found to see Art Spiegelman, the uh, author illustrator of the Mouse books, uh, came over to see this after I finished it and he, he gasped so loudly when he saw it, I was worried he was gonna have a heart attack. Uh, it's called um, Hitler's Yo-Yo, Zissel, the street musician, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer with honorary horns. Um, and I, I took out, in lieu of Hitler's head, I have the, the Sturmer, the anti-Semitic Nazi publication. On the yo-yo, um, um, I did a depiction from a black and white illustration I'd seen of a papal bull, an edict from, I forget, 1400s, calling on Christians of the time to burn copies of the Talmud, a Jewish religious book, a Nazi beer coaster, um, and uh, domes from synagogues in Berlin and in Budapest. The chicken, a Bremen chicken, and uh, from a book called Extraordinary Chickens. Has anybody ever seen that? Mm -hmm. And a wonderful book. There's an Extraordinary Chickens too, a volume, a second volume. Zissel, an itinerant Jewish street musician, um, a photograph published in a book called Image Before My Eyes, Im uh, images of Polish life in pre-war um, Poland. Bonhoeffer from a a photograph of him as a child in a book I'd gotten from the library, a Dietrich Bonhoeffer wife in pictures, and honorary horns I gave him, and, uh, as well as this toy, like armature, like uh, arrow thing somebody had given me years ago. Um, and the, the pastor exclaimed, Bonhoeffer, he says, there's a lot of Bonhoeffer supporters worldwide. How could you do this? I said, listen, he didn't, he wasn't, uh, arrested for trying to save Jews, but he did good work with the Confessing Church and uh, gave, you know, lost his life uh, as part of the resistance. So, speaking of the resistance, um, Sophie Scholl of the White Rose Resistance Group, uh, a drawing from a photograph, no, uh, she might be the only drawing I've done without wings, and I had to look. Uh, I had seen a photograph of this girl named Fiorella Anticoli at the Children's Museum at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, holding an accordion. I actually just learned what year she was born, uh, right before I flew out to 
from Seattle to Boston and then to Manchester, England. Uh, I found it online in, in her website. I hadn't seen it before. Uh, she was born around 1933. She died after liberation at um, Buchenwald. Her father was alive in Rome. I don't know how, if he managed, how, how it was that he, he was not arrested with all the Jews that were arrested in Rome. She was photographed with American GIs and it was reproduced in newspapers around Europe. He saw the photo, hoped for her survival, but she didn't make it. I have yet to see that photo of her. I'm curious to see if it's, um, if it's well, anyway, I haven't seen it. Um, a drawing I did from a photograph I'd seen in the website of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum of a gypsy, AKA like Romani or Cindy boy, in the, web, uh, in the Holocaust Museum's website. So I wrote them and asked them if I could buy a print of the photo. And they referred me to the National Archives in Koblenz, is that the name of the city? Mm -hmm. And I wrote them and they said, so I sent whatever, $20 money order or something, and I received a photograph and they said, interestingly enough, because World War II ended like a long time ago, they said I could not reproduce the photograph anywhere. Um, and actually, I can reproduce my artwork and um, have this kind of, my imagination, this almost like a unicorn without a horn there. This whatever fantasy animal, flowers, plants, from the photographs from the entryway at the Auschwitz Arbeitnacht Frei, the bird from a book I <coughs> had from the library about um, um, species that were going extinct in the United States, wildlife. The black triangle uh, worn by uh, gypsy uh, prisoners. I'm assuming that the boy in the photograph uh, did not survive the war, but with no name or documentation, that's um, well, it's a likely guess anyway. 2003, I did this first drawing uh, for the Sightseeing with Dignity Human Rights Art Series. Benjamin Hermanson was a 15-year-old black-skinned Norwegian youth murdered by um, um, a group of uh, like white racist skinheads in the late teens and early 20s in Oslo. A year before, he had been uh, harassed at a soccer match, which really unsettled him. His mother was white Norwegian, and his father was um, black from Ghana. He got involved in an anti-racist group, but then was in the wrong place at the wrong time when he was murdered. Another uh, kind of fantasy-like animal here. The actual feathers, I found these uh, abandoned in the building where my art studio was so many years after we had an earthquake in Seattle in 2001. Took them home, drew them here. Then when I was framing the work I, for an exhibit, I had a frame that was too big, like across, and I decided to, I actually, place the, uh, these feathers in the frames so people can actually see it. Um, plants from, I picked up in Florida. Uh, I collect like rocks, stones, bones, things like that on walks. And the last thing I did on the drawing was, uh, I, looked, I had the space and I thought, wanted to find something that could relate my life to the life of someone of a different generation who I would never meet because he was murdered. Um, from a country I've never been to, language I don't speak, Norwegian, and I finally uh, saw headphones lying on a counter or a table or something. I thought, music, that's the type of thing that could tie people of different generations together. Under the Wings 48, drawn a year later, Italian Jewish resistance hero Eugenio Curiel, Castel Sant'Angelo, Hadrian's tomb, and my flying she, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Obi Juju Kenobi. Um, I had this work we'll see in a second, an exhibit at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma near Seattle in 2003. I gave a talk to a bunch of German Lang Lit students and um, all the other drawings in the exhibit was in the university library were just straight black and white drawings and then there was this other work, this one, and they didn't know what to make of it. And uh, it, was, it was an interesting, uh, interesting kind of Q&A I had with the uh, audience there of students. Um, the word she got in the title, as I was reading the late Nigerian writer Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart at the time, and I learned about something that I had no knowledge of, like a Nigerian pre-colonial village society. She was like everyone had their own personal god, which is how the, the uh, title came about. With 
this clappity clap wind up chicken toy that a former girlfriend had given me, um, and which you see there, a bunch of uh, dreidel spin toys from the Jewish holiday called Hanukkah flying around. Alex Schwartz, the late a Viennese refugee Jewish survivor friend uh, in Seattle. Linoleum block print I did from a small drawing I did of him in Vienna. So three, uh, three of those uh, um, on the, in the uh, overall work. And um, Curiel was uh, murdered you know, by Italian fascists. What year was that? Uh, 1940, oh, right towards the last year, last months of the war. Um, Desno, from France, Robert Desno. I would say, we would say Robert Desnos, a surrealist poet, the author of thousands of radio commercials and a literary music and art critic. There is a poignant passage about his last days after liberation at Terezin, aka Terezienstadt, the Nazi prison camp in Czechoslovakia, and the text of the book, there's the cover of it uh, by Anne Weiss, uh, Eyes from the Ashes of Auschwitz. Uh, I met her at <coughs> my first <coughs> teaching conference at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem in 1999. <coughs> she had gone to the Auschwitz death camp memorial site and museum, was, uh, got permission to view thousands of photographs that have been saved by Sandra commandos. And she photographed about, I forget, maybe several hundred of them. Then she spent 10 years crisscrossing the globe trying to find out who the people were in the photographs. And one of the photographs is a photograph of Desno inscribed to someone who had it evidently with him in his clothing, inscribed to someone by first name who would have been murdered from the camp. That's a uh, lino cut I did last year of Desno, um, which I have a part of uh, one of his poems uh, written as uh, kind of the title going around it. And this is called Sorrows of Love and the Intolerable Absence of Powerful Emotion, La Pathétique, coming from also something that he wrote. And, and you can see the whole title there. And in lieu of wings, as he was surrealist, I decided to do, I, I took um, several different drawings from old sketchbooks. This one I had done in Scotland, like from a bus or train in 1987. Uh, a ship from uh, fishing, fishing boats in Seattle, um, and other things. Uh, some of them I drew new specifically for it, kind of meant to just have this dreamlike uh, atmosphere around the portrait of him from a photograph of him. Uh, an early drawing from the Human Rights Art series. I don't know her, know her name, a Cambodian woman and her infant murdered at, the, uh, at a, a killing center in Phnom Penh in uh, 1977 or 78. Here's a, another uh, drawing I did also, Khmer Rouge. I took the title from something um, that I read about the Khmer Rouge. And it's interesting because, you know, as brutal, as horrendous as they were, the mass murders, you have this type of um, flowery uh, titling that shows up in all manner of uh, governments and security agencies and whatever. It doesn't have to be like them or Ceausescu in Romania. It could be the United States or wherever. Be on guard against the strategy and tactics of the enemy. Um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but uh, you have a close to a murder date. S21 was a, a, had been a high school before the Khmer Rouge took over in Phnom Penh. A drawing I did of a, um, probably during the time, by the way. <laughs> Good, thanks. Um, a mosaic drawing, this was, there are now eight mosaic drawing combos done. This was around, the, I forget, might have been the third or fourth. Um, she was a Croatian Jewish victim. Her nephew was a year older than me, born in a Israeli guy, raised in Haifa, now retired as a math teacher at Ithaca College in upstate New York, where I had gone to lecture um, 2002, I think it was, and I had met him, and I asked him if he had any family photos when I found out his family history, and he sent me a photograph of his, his mother and his aunt Mira seated in a park in Sarajevo in 1937. And his mother's hands were on his aunt Mira's waist. And um, subsequent emails, I learned more about her. So she was um, <coughs> raped, he said, and murdered by Ustashi fascists around 1942 and um, drowned. 
And uh, when people have asked me, why is she upside down? They say, well, the artwork is right side up. Upside down, right side up is all a matter of how you want to go to visual perception. But when I think of people drowning, similar to when I think of people, let's say, like falling out of airplanes or whatever, um, they could be going any which direction. So um, that's kind of how that happened. Um, and the Hebrew uh, al alphabet of going around here and then continuing over here. There are rocks and stones and a bone I picked up in walks around Jerusalem on the bottom, including a uh, rock I picked up at the cemetery I walked into where Oscar Schindler is buried. I remember someone back in Seattle asked me, how could you take a rock out of a cemetery? I said, listen, in Israel, the Palestinian territories, Gaza and the West Bank, there's no shortage of rocks and stones. That they, they won't miss it. Um, and uh, this here, it didn't, because of the grout that I chose, this came out really not as defined as I hoped it would. I should have used like a dark grout. But it's from a photograph um, in a book called um, Synagogues Without Jews. I had met the couple who authored it at, a, at a comp another conference at Yad Vashem and from a, a synagogue in, um, in Serbia. Um, this here, one of these kind of funky fish creatures that show up in different works of mine uh, from time to time. <clears throat> Rita Rosani, the dome of the great synagogue of Rome, <clears throat> a Bayer Leverkusen aspirin container from Berlin, a menorah lamp that's in the center, uh, bought in Jaffa, which is a, a kind of mixed Arab Jewish city near Tel Aviv, uh, uh, the plant at upper left, a Star of David down there, and uh, a Bartolino wine bottle. <clears throat> this is drawn in 2010. The aspirin container had belonged to the mother of a longtime artist friend of mine in Seattle. His mother had been on a Fulbright to Berlin around 1952-53. And after she died, uh, after she passed a few, about, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, I ended up with several of her books and this Bayer aspirin container. I, I read, I looked up Bayer Company, and they were involved in war crimes uh, under the, during the Nazi era. So that's over there. The dome of the uh, great synagogue I <coughs> drew on site, and then I cut it out of the sketchbook it was in, and I visited Rome for about a week, <coughs> seven years ago. She was the only woman to die in combat against the Nazis and fascists or whatever in Italy. She was a young Jewish teacher from Trieste. Sightseeing with Dignity Series number 10, uh, and I've, I've combined Sholem Alechem, which is Hebrew, and Salam Alechem, which is Arabic, uh, for the title. Shalom Alechem, Salam Alechem, drawn in 2010. I don't know the name of the boy on the left. He was a Gazan, probably Muslim. There are hardly any non Muslims in Gaza, uh, killed in an Israeli missile strike. Um, the boy, I know his name, he was 13, he lived with his family there in a settlement in the West Bank. Killed in an attack there. There's the drawing when it was in progress. I had bought a, uh, they had these like dollar stores in the States, um, and I bought a set of toys made in China. Um, there's like a water pistol, of, like a plastic replica of like an old American West gun, Zorro mask, sheriff badge, which are portrayed in the drawing. I used some of the same things in a different human rights series drawing I did of Harvey Milk, the assassinated um, gay San Francisco alderman, like city councilman. Uh, Primo Levi. A few years ago, I did the drawing several years ago. Um, it has this kind of unusual uh, shape I made. Um, from the portrait from this photograph which I'd seen on the internet, one of the problems on the internet for writers, visual artists, photographers, so many things being reproduced with no attribution. A few years after I did it, I found out who did the photograph, who a uh, South African-born photographer lives in London named Gillian Edelstein, who photographed Levy uh, 1986, the year before he died. I was actually living in Aberdeen in 87 when I was artist in residence, and I read in the Independent uh, a full page article which I saved about Levy, which was my first introduction. I hadn't read any of his work until that time. Uh, two mosaic drawing combos done in the last, I don't know, five, six years. 
This one from an astonishing photograph I'd seen in a book called The Pictorial History of the Holocaust, published by Yad Vashem. This Orthodox religious Jewish guy with a prayer shawl with these um, kind of religious ritual things on his arm outside, under barbed wire, with his arms up in the air, probably moments before he was going to be shot. <clears throat> Orthodox Jew under uh, barbed wire, Okush Poland, 1940. I was able to get some British anti-Nazi, <coughs> British Army <coughs> anti-Nazi, like kind of anti-tank, well, British Army anti-Nazi history into two of the mosaic drawn combos. There's a metal rod here and all this barbed wire, which I encased in a, um, like a glass ashtray I bought at a, uh, like a Salvation Army store. Um, I picked up on walks uh, north of Aberdeen <clears throat> where there was all these decaying uh, World War II fortifications like on the beach. And um, this is uh, my great grandmother here um, and uh, a Mickey Mouse toy here. I don't know if my great grandmother ever saw a movie. It's possible she might have. She might have known who Mickey Mouse was, but it ended up in there. One way to get rid of stuff for me. Artists collect too much junk is to put some of them in, in these mosaics. Sophie Scholl making a rare appearance from the other side of the um, Corrections Corporation of Prison Hospital uh, bed of uh, Bubakar Ba, uh, Newark, New Jersey, uh, 2007. I'm a little out of sync time-wise here. So this was done before the last two mosaic drawn combos. She's the only person from the Wayne series showing up in the Human Rights Art series. I read a big New York Times article about this guy. He was an immigrant from Guinea had overstayed his initial visa, had gone back to see family in Guinea, West Africa, was arrested when he came back to New York and ended up in this um, contract prison run by the United States Department of Justice where he died uh, after having hit his head on the toilet in his cell and then uh, was ignored by guards despite like throw it, vomiting and foaming at the mouth. And the article mentioned that in the draconian laws after 9-11-2001, prisoners who die, um, like illegal immigrants, there's like hardly any information comes out about them. And all the writing that you see on there is writing that copied from the uh, article. I think we're nearing completion here. This is the second work I did as the companion piece for Ellie's Sin that I showed you early on that I did after I came back from the first trip to Poland. It's called Bonhoeffer the Juda, Bonhoeffer the Jew. Um, it's called Bonhoeffer the Juda with special um, guest appearances by Rudiger Schleicher and um, 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 Alex Schwartz, the uh, Viennese Jewish um, refugee survivor I knew in Seattle. There's also the Mickey Mouse actually shows up here uh, a little parody of um, the French resistance. It says something like, uh, Mickey in his uh, French resistance disguise. Some of you may be familiar with the movie called The Sorrow and the Pity, which critically addressed um, the French resistance. Um, uh, excuse my pronunciation, Professor. Uh, Judenblut von Messer Spritz a Jewish blood shall flow or something like that. So um, the, um, this, this, and this were from photos in a book I have called The Precious Leg Legacy, which is about this um, 100,000 or so items from Bohemia and Moravia that were stolen by the Nazis from the Czech Jews who they murdered en masse for their planned museum of the extinct Jewish race. Um, Rudiger Schleicher was a brother-in-law of Bonhoeffer. They were both executed like two to three weeks before the World War II ended in Europe. Um, there's the third work. Uh, they're all the same size. Um, and I call them the Shoah Trilogy. I'm hoping to have them exhibited as a three, three work uh, installation somewhere or sometime. So I mentioned uh, Jew Alert in the Ellie Sin piece and how someone had chuckled on the, uh, on the seeing it in my studio a few years ago, so when I was working on this, uh, I did a uh, Jew in the Room. Brings me back to something, a, a book I read by late American Jewish uh, WPA 1940s era photographer, Ben Shan, who was also a painter. 
And he wrote a book called, um, I forget the name of it, but he, he wrote something like, uh, people would love the idea of going to a cocktail party where uh, there'd be a Van Gogh painting on the wall, but they'd be mortified, appalled, if Van Gogh himself were standing there drinking like you know, a glass of wine or a cocktail. So um, that kind of my power, uh, whatever. Uh, it's ink, gouache, like watercolor, uh, linoleum block, woodcut fragments. Um, we have a drawing I did of a, a young children's toy there. Um, I'm going to show you a detail here. Augen Auf from a flyer I picked up at the Jewish Old Folks Home in Vienna when I visited Alex Schwartz, which also had a black and white portrayal of these eyes. A warning leaflet all around the building for residents to be aware of suspicious packages. You'll notice Hebrew writing in my great uncle's hair. Um, Liebel, who had moved from Bialystok area, lived in Berlin, was married to a Jewish woman named Hindel. They lived in Berlin, had two children, born in 1923 in the late 20s. I don't know the names of the kids, but they all vanished during the years of the Holocaust. Here's a close-up. Um, this is kind of a takeoff from the, um, the movie Cabaret. Some of you may be familiar with that. Joel Gray, Lisa Minnelli, Bill Comen, Mesdames and Messieurs, Vickers, Jewfish, Holy Mackerel. This is sardines in Hebrew. And in the writing in my great uncle Liebel's head. Let me go back one quickly, just to give you an idea of how much detail there's all these little heads, mud mouths, nose, and eyes there. The Hebrew writing in written Yiddish, which I copied from the photo at left, you see on top there, in the hair of the portrait of my great uncle Liebel, is seen in ink at the top of the photo. I'm repeating myself, sorry. Translates to Malvish Aromim. Members of the Clothing of the Naked Society, Helm, Poland. That's the uh, book, and I still see their faces when I uh, saw the photo. This is, I'm guessing this was probably taken around 1900 to 1910, something like that. So these would have been um, probably better off town members. It looks like they have clothing and shoes here to, hand, to give, you know, collected for indigent um, people in the, in the city, in Helm. Uh, another drawing from the Human Rights Art Series, Chico Mendes was a uh, Brazilian rubber tapper, environmental defender, and Amazonian rainforest uh, defender, shot to death uh, age 44 in 1988 by a rancher. And uh, also sometimes use other uh, artwork I did in, that I began in Poland in 1984, um, which was not conserved properly. Um, I had uh, saved all the drawing fragments from, and some of which are all in this um, work about Chico Mendes from a, a whole different uh, continent away. But everything kind of interrelates to me. Uh, the plants uh, drawn in my, my, my flat, which doubles as my studio and storage all in one. Um, I found this sort of photograph on the internet was mesmerized by it, a multiple amputee seated outdoors awaiting deportation to um, Nazi death camp, I think it was at Kelmno. And I was struck by the tactile uh, quality of everything in her garments, like this blanket, her, uh, the uh, blouse or shirt, the rope, rope holding a, I don't know, like a metal bucket or something. Armless, legless, even the scarf has tactile. That's the drawing when it was in progress. After I completed the work, uh, I did find out, I didn't know if she was Jewish or non-Jewish. She was targeted, would have been targeted for death either way by the Nazis as either being Jewish or as an amputee. So it's called, it's called multiple amputee awaiting deportation. Um, actually, she was in loads in English, woods in Poland. And, and here's where she was seated in the photograph. And now we are nearing the end here. Two Sorry, what was the name? What was the name? I don't know her name. You didn't. Don't know her name. The only thing I was able to find out is that she was um, she was Jewish. I didn't even know if she was Polish, but she likely would have been. Um, 2015, the second to last mosaic drawing combo I've done of the eight completed so far. Pierre Jacques, righteous person of France. He was a priest and head of a school. His work in trying to save French Jews is made known to moviegoers worldwide in the 1987 movie Au revoir les enfants, Goodbye Children. 
directed by the late French movie director, who died a long time ago, Louis Mao, who had been a student pupil in the school. One of the Jewish boys was his best friend. That's actual photograph of Père Jacques that I did the drawing from. You see in progress there, a still from the movie. Pupils uh, watching a Charlie Chaplin movie. Um, two pages above left uh, in a book published 1930 in Paris, The Structure and Biology of Fish. I remember, I used to get through my junior high school French from 50, 50 years ago. Um, I bought the book at a charity thrift shop in Cooper, Scotland a few years ago. And I still wonder, it's possible that the school could have had this very, a, a different copy of the same book though, in the school. This fish here is the one I drew there, like in a marking pen. There you see the uh, mosaic as I'm working on it. I buy like old plates, like at a big Goodwill store, like a charity thrift shop. And then I break them apart with a hammer, with a um, tile cutter, a uh, very laborious uh, work. Uh, here's the. That whole section finished, but before it was grouted. Um, these things take about five months, by the way. Um, and uh, again, more uh, kind of like funky kind of fish here and here. And I pointed out in the, a small one in the mosaic of the uh, mirror sign of the young Jewish woman from Sarajevo. This also from a walk um, a couple of years later. Um, in Newborough, north of um, Aberdeen in Scotland, where I picked up more um, tools, like from these British Army anti-1941-42 fortifications. Um, the drawing on the bottom is recent from the Human Rights Series. Uh, Elizabeth Blanche Olofia was a radio journalist in the Central African Republic. Um, she was targeted by gunmen in, I think it was 2014, died a year later of her injuries. The drawing on top was a landmark, made the 25th drawing in the Human Rights Art Series. I just completed it um, like this winter. Um, and I've, uh, I've merged two people of different ages and different backgrounds. Um, Fernando Brodsky was 22 when he was murdered by the Argentinian Air Force in 1979, thrown out of a plane probably over the Atlantic. Um, Maura Clark was a married old missionary and nun in El Salvador. Uh, she and three other nuns were raped and murdered in 1979 by El Salvador National Guardsmen. And actually, after I did this, just recently I read a New York Times book review about a new book about her life. I, um, I wrote the book reviewer and the author of the book just a couple, few weeks ago, but I haven't uh, heard back from yet. I, I sent them a photograph of the drawing. I thought they might find it of interest. Uh, now, we're just about at the end here. The periodic table, excerpt from the chapter iron. Note, Levy's use of the word gay predates its current usage here, as it means happy. He was the son of a mason and spent his summers working as a shepherd. Not a shepherd of souls, a shepherd of sheep, and not because of Arcadian rhetoric or eccentricity, but happily out of love for the earth and grass and abundance of heart. He had a curious mimetic talent. And when he talked about cows, chickens, sheep, and dogs, he was transformed, imitating their way of looking, their movements and voices, becoming very gay and seeming to turn into a sh an animal himself like a shaman. I love this passage. Uh, a number of editions of the book in English. Primo Levi on the left, Sandro Donascio on the right. Sandro Donascio, that's the photograph I used for the drawing, which we'll see in a sec. Seated on this rock ledge, it makes me dizzy looking at it standing here. Like, several thousand feet up. This would have been uh, in the mountains either north or northwest of Turin. What is that mountain range uh, called? Like um, in the northwest. Uh, Turin. Turin. Turin, Turin yeah. Turin. Uh, there's the work of the eight mosaic drawing combos. This is the only one where I've drawn a wing in the uh, drawing part. It's uh, covered with plexiglass and sealed in. And um, I decided to, uh, in lieu of his hands, as seen seated in the photograph, like on his knee there, I decided to engage in a little bit of uh, um, a visual equivalent of Latin American literary uh, magic realism, like in Latin American writing. And I drew a horse's head because of his love of animals, as Primo Levi described. And uh, there you see there. 
uh, a work I did this past November when I was home for about five weeks with bronchitis. Uh, excuse my pronunciation again. Uh, Schopfung und Fall, the title of a book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, Creation and Fall. Uh, Anti-Nazi German Protestant resistors, Dr. Hans John, Justin Friedrich Perels, and Three Demon Apparitions, which are here, here, and on the upper right there. This area here was from a photograph of um, Tegel, if I'm pronouncing it right, Tegel cell, this uh, prison in, uh, near Berlin, in the suburbs of Berlin, where there were like political prisoners who saw were imprisoned by the Nazis. Um, I did two drawings very recently for specifically, exclusively for primary school audiences, and especially as refugees are in the news so much, and Islamophobia and all this business going on in the news worldwide. This is, well, this is the first one. The Sea Monsters and the Sailing Ship St. Louis, 1939. Um, the ship left Hamburg then with about 900 Jewish passengers for Havana. About 20 were actually able to get into Havana. And all the rest, uh, it went near Miami, Florida, near Nova Scotia. The Americans and Canadians both turned the ship away. And all the remaining passengers, let's say like 800 and 80 of them or so were um, disembarked in Antwerp, Belgium. The British did very good. Thank you, Great Britain. They took in a number of the passengers. Those that, of those that went to France and Belgium, a number of them perished like at Auschwitz and elsewhere. I don't know the names yet of this girl and these two children from portable photographs, but I read that the United States Holocaust Museum in DC has been, I don't know if they've completed it yet, and I didn't have time to look it up, but they were researching everyone who was on the ship to find out what happened to them. This man, a uh, young man, he was 22 when he died at Auschwitz. He was 19 when the ship left uh, in 1939. I read about him in a book by his nephew, who was a fellow my age, um, and named Martin Goldsmith, um, who did classical music on the radio for years, not as a performer, but as a uh, like programmer. And he wrote a book about his parents, who I believe are gone now. They were both um, German Jewish refugees who made it to the States. And the, this man was the brother of, his, of Martin Goldsmith's dad. His name was Klaus Helmut Goldschmidt. Uh, a symbolic portrayal in a portal there of the entryway of Auschwitz and the signage. And we've got like these sea monsters, like here, a little one there, and this big one engulfing the whole ship there, and another one here. Uh, to conclude with something upbeat, the speckled North American gefilte fish. I don't know if anyone knows what gefilte fish is here. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, one of four drawings I've drawn so far for a proposed educational children's picture book on saltwater and freshwater gefilte fish. So uh, I've actually merged the, um, the speckled North Atlantic gefilte with like a Hanukkah menorah for fun. And it says, like, speckled North Atlantic gefilte. Uh, in, in Yiddish, which is in Hebrew letters. So that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Akiva, for a very effective uh, sort of, um, yeah, giving us insight into your layer and it's very beautiful work. Um, I think we'll take questions at the end, if that's okay. Yeah, so we want to, to mark. Sure, yeah. that, that's fine. Sure. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, I just will present to you briefly a few major works when it comes to Holocaust and Third Reich nar narratives which share a specific light on the development and uh, dis dis describe as well or analyze how it came to the Holocaust. And um, for this reason, I um, present to you here the major, major works, major works um, Starting with Leon Feuchtwanger's The Oppermanns, um, I will talk about this a little later, um, as well as Franz Werfel's Pale Blue Ink in a Lady's Hand um, from 1940, Anna Segas' The Seventh Cross, Stefan's Zweig Chess, Ernst Wichers' Der Totenwald, Hans Fallada Alone in Berlin, in Berlin. Um, I put this in brackets. I will say a few words about this in a second. Um, Anna Frank, the diary of Anna Frank, a diary of a young girl, um, or in Germany as it is known, the diary of Anna Frank, Elie Wiesel Knight, um, Primo Levi, if this is a man, Imre Kertisch, Faithless, and finally Fania Fenelon, the musicians of Auschwitz. Um, just um, Talking about the um, two works I won't discuss or I won't uh, mention here intensively. First of all um, is Hans Fallada Alone in Berlin. Um, a film has recently been made. There has been some films have been made um, in the 70s in Germany, but now a film with Emma Thompson and Brandon Gleason, which should have been out in March. Uh, this year, but I haven't seen it so far in the cinemas. As well in America, apparently a good film um, dealing with um, the resistance against the Nazis in Germany. Um, the other work I won't discuss or I won't present you in more detail is Fania Fenelon's The Musicians of Auschwitz. Fania Fenelon was a French resistance um, fighter, and, um, and she was proud that she was caught even fighting the Nazis and later played in the uh, orchestra in the... Sorry, uh, can you speak up? Who, 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 who did you mention? Fania Fenelon. Fenelon. She later, um, she later um, um, was a musician in the Auschwitz orchestra, in the in the infamous orchestra which the Nazis introduced. So here are the writer's connection with the Holocaust. Most of the works are written by victims. Some experience the death comes directly. Levi Wiesel Kertes, as a Hungarian friend, friend told me, I have to pronounce him Kertes, not Kertes. Uh, Wichert Fenelon and survived it. So they survived it. Anne Frank, of course, did not survive. Others emigrated, Zweig, Segas, and Feuchtwanger. We come back to them. And Falada was in and out of a mental institution. Falada was uh, not Jewish, but and he has a kind of ambiguous relationship to the Nazis. But since Primo Levi praised this work, especially alone in Berlin, um, as the greatest book ever written about German resistance to the Nazis. I wanted to mention it here briefly. Um, this is about a normal bourgeoisie family in Berlin who f um, lose um, their son and then become resistance fighters by um, um, placing postcards everywhere over Berlin and of course at the time the Nazis were well organized, they got caught and are uh, murdered too. Um, it is based uh, on the real family um, Quangel, in the book it's, the family is called Hampel, but originally they are called uh, Quangel and they lost not their son but um, a relative cousin or aunt. And they were not very educated so they are their uh, postcards are full of spelling mistakes and so on, but you sh could see the resistance they um, had here against the Nazis. And I saw the 
trailer, trailer of the film was Emma Thompson and Breden, Brendan Gleeson in the main, uh, as main characters, and I thought that might be worth watching. Um, now let's talk about one of the first books uh, published um, on the Third Reich and the, how the Nazis took over in 1930, 1933. Uh, this is Leon Feuchtwanger's The Oppermanns. It was published in 1933, but fully imagining the future of Germany over the ensuing years, The Oppermanns tells the compelling story of a German Jewish family confronted by Hitler's rise to power. This precious sent novel strives to awaken an often unsuspecting, sometimes politically na naive or else willfully blind world to the consequences of its stance in the face of national events, in this case, the rising tide of Nazism in Germany. Um, it's good to know that Feuchtwanger's books were burned in 1913 uh, 1933 by the Nazis when they came to power. So, um, and he was fortunately on a reading tour in the USA and did not come back and couldn't be prosecuted. Um, his house was plundered by the Nazis. Um, the this is a picture of Leon Feichtwanger. The New York Times on March 1930. Uh, four wrote on the Oppermans, the story of the Oppermans appeals to our reason, our sense of justice, our indignation, its addresses to the German people who will not be allowed to read it, urging them to open their eyes and it is addressed to the world outside, bearing the message, wake up, the barbarians are upon us. This is the really important point here, it, the story told is a story who is um, can be studied these days in many f um, other surroundings. So it is a real story. Feuchtwanger said about historical novels, um, this is a picture of Bertolt Brecht and uh, Leon Feuchtwanger in, a G in exile, Ex uh, Brecht, another refugee, a communist who had to flee from Germany. They wrote scripts there for film in Los, in, for films living in Los Angeles. So the USA gave them shelter, but most of their scripts were never made to films. However, um, they found a place to live there and to carry on writing. Um, and Feuchtwanger is important to us because this novel, The Oppermanns, is indeed a novel who deals with um, a whole generation of people who loses everything they possess. And it is a, a generation who was only re-established in the last 40, 50 years. In the beginning, it was quite difficult to give back what they had because there were still old Nazis sitting, sitting on their um, 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 on their belongings, on their property. What is Feichtwanger saying about historical novels? Asking the author of historical novels to teach you about history is like expecting the composer of a melody to provide answers about radio um, transitions. So he's not teaching about history, he's saying, but his novel, The Opponents, is really absolutely very, very telling when it comes to the first years of Nazi dictatorship, when it comes to the fear, oppression, and tyranny we have to expect. The next writer, important writer, is Anna Segers um, and her work, The Seventh Cross. Um, she had a sharp eye or keen eye for the circumstances in Germany at the time. Um, and she as well analyzes and presents the fear, oppression and brutality accurately in, in her novel, Even While Abroad. She wrote The Seven Cross in the year um, 1942, uh, I think she finished it. She lived between 1900 and 1983, and after exile in South America, 
she returned to the G GDR like Brecht and rem remained there. The Seven Cross is a very interesting work because it deals with the first years of the Nazi dictatorship. And um, it does this um, in um, a telling way. Written in 1939, first published in 32, it was published in 42, sorry, a mistake. The Seven Cross presented to a still doubtful, naive America a first hand account of life in Hitler's Germany and the horrors of the dead comes. Seven men attempt an escape from Westhofen after the escape. The camp commander erects seven crosses, one for each. Only one, the young communist Heisler, survive, not by cunning or superior skills, but through the complicity of a web of common citizens unwilling to bow to the Gestapo and forced to make decisions that will determine the character of their future lives. There was a film made, I showed you the picture before, in 1942, The Seventh uh, Cross, with Spencer Tracy, um, um, who is very interesting and very, very accurate when you, hear, when you study the time in Germany soon as the Nazis took over. You know the first concentration comes were established in 1933 for political prisoners and then slowly developed in what we know today as the Holocaust. Another work I want to mention in this surrounding comes up a little later, but um, one uh, quotation from Anna Segas from the Seventh Cross. Um, much later, someone telling about that morning said, the bringing in of Wallau made upon his prisoners about the same impression as the fall of Barcelona or Franco's entry into Madrid or some other event that showed clearly that the enemy had all the power in the world on his side. The novel, The Seven Cross, is told from the perspective of um, the prisoners inside the camp the seven um, prisoners escape and the commander put seven cross up and six uh, prisoners are captured one remains outside and um, survives um, Valau is the storyteller in the film not so in the book he is one of the seven who escaped the sto st storyteller in the camp camp so the reader experienced this the, sorry the storyteller is in the camp in the book so the reader experienced the story from his perspective in the film we have a voice over as storyteller so we have somebody from outside well, when you read the book and that's why um, it is probably so um, brilliant because you are you find yourself in the on the um, position in the position of one of the prisoners um, and fear with them what's going on outside. The other book I wanted to mention by Anna Segas is Transit. It deals with the Nazi dictatorship and tyranny uh, from another uh, um, position. This is um, um, a book who tells um, the story of many different characters. Having escaped from a Nazi concentration camp in Germany in 1937 and later a camp in Rouen, the nameless 27-year-old German narrator of Seger's multi-layered novel ends up in the dusty seaport of Marseille. There, in the giant waiting room of Marseille, the narrator converses with the refugees listening to their story, stories over pizza and wine. The storyline depicts perfectly well the atmosphere of fear and anxiety and of people without papers trying to escape before the approaching Nazi army in France, or before the Nazi army could catch them. Um, so we have quite a few famous people in this situation who try to get papers and um, by, by, try to escape by ship from Marseille to South America or the United States. Um, Franz Werfel, a, a writer I mentioned already, and will, uh, I will come back to him in a, in a minute, um, escaped via the Pyrenees together with um, Heinrich Mann and um, Walter Benjamin. 
So this area that the novel Transit shows those people who lives in the part of France which is still liberated but um, fear that the Nazis will um, take over this part as well and again it shows you the, um, the, well, the horror and brutality and the, um, the, the, the evil Nazi dictatorship. This is another book dealing with the first passages of the Holocaust now. It's by a friend Franz Werfel and called Pale Blue Ink in a Lady's Hand. Um, is in many ways a prequel to what is known as Holocaust literature. It is about a long suppressed love triangle between Leonidas Tachetzi, a high level Austrian career bureaucrat, his younger trophy wife, Amelia and a Jewish woman from his past, Vera Bonsa, with whom he had fallen in love when she was 14. After his marriage, Leonidas encounters Vera in a German university town where she is studying philosophy. He makes a promise that implies marriage but drops out of her life entirely to return to comfortable, comfortable existence until one day when a letter arrives addressed with Vera's unmistakable unmistakable handwriting in pale blue ink. Uh, Leonidas, the main character here, um, is presented as a diplomatic but at the same time as a coward. He um, does not want to, um, he's not, his relationship with Vera doesn't bother him too much. And this only um, changes when a letter arrives, uh, and this is um, a quotation from the novel, um, picture by Franz Werfel, who is now on a stamp in stamp in um, in Austria. Um, a letter arrives here in this novel, a harmless request letter. But in this harmless request, Vera had informed him that she had a grown son, and this son was his. So he had an affair with Vera, but dropped her and just, um, stayed with her, rich, which his rich wife. Um, um, and as soon as he realized, oh, I might have a son with Vera, for a moment he intends to be brave and stand up for his son and for the rights of his lover. But as soon as he realizes that Vera doesn't ask him to help for his son, but for a son of a friend, he turns back to his old habits of ignorance. Though the novel is situated in between the, um, so it is situated before the annexation of Austria through Germany, Werfel presents the already existing atmosphere of suppression and tyranny in Austria perfectly well. So really, indeed, a prequel to Holocaust literature. The other work in this respect is Stefan's Zweig Chess, also known as the Royal Game, or simply Chess, is the Austrian master Stefan Zweig's final novella. It is the only story in which, in which Zweig looks at Nazism, and he does it so with characteristic emphasis on the psychological. Travelers by ship from New York to Buenos Aires find that on board with them is the world champion of chess, an arrogant and unfriendly man. They come together to try their skills against him and are soundly defeated. Then a mysterious passenger steps forward to advise them and their fortunes change. Um, in Zweig's novel, novella, the Nazis have already taken over control in Austria. Um, imprisonment and torture was already in place. Um, I try, I read you um, um, one passage from the novella. I wasn't allowed to sit down in the anteroom where I had to wait on my feet for two hours. There was a calendar and I can't tell how you, uh, can't tell you how in my hunger for the printed word, for something written, I stared and stared at the one number, those few words on the wall, July 27th. 
And then I went on waiting, waiting, staring at the door, wondering when it would finally open. Again, this is a kind of autobiographical works. Zweig was imprisoned briefly um, by the Nazis, but was, through help of friends, and he was quite a very famous writer, able to escape. And people would let people wait. The Nazis, of course, um, uh, used torture and let people simply wait for hours and hours. Uh, this character in the novella finds a book with chess um, games, and he plays these games over and over again to have something to rely on. And so, in so far, um, this novella shows the um, shows already some signs of what's coming on in the years when the war starts in 1939. This is a short look at um, Anna Diary, the diary of a young girl, Anna Frank, the diary of a young girl. Um, as we know, Anna Frank's life ended tragically in the dead camp of Bergen-Belsen in March 45. Three months later, she would have been 16. Two months later, Holland was liberated by the Allies. What we know of her brief life was found in her diary, abandoned on the floor of her family's hiding place in Amsterdam. Um, Fear and oppression, oppression from the perspective of a child in occupied Holland is presented here. Um, again, the first steps towards the Holocaust. And we reach it now with the work of um, Elie Wiesel, um, Elie Wiesel's Night. Um, terrifying account of the Nazi death comes, horror that turns a young Jewish boy into an agonized witness to the death of his family, or rather his father, the deaths of his innocence and the death of his God. Um, important in this novel, or we have to talk about the term novel a bit more later um, before I finish in a few minutes. Um, the, the, the term um, the term novel is complicated because these are rather is this non-fiction or semi-fiction with an autobiographical uh, background. I saw other hangings. I never saw a single vic victim weep. These withered, withered bodies had long forgotten the bitter taste of the t tears. This is from Elie Wiesel's Night. It is situated directly uh, in the concentration camps um, in Auschwitz and Buchenwald. And um, this passage leads to the sequence in the book where a boy is hanged and one of the prisoners asks, where is God? And another one answers, he is hanging just there. So the lose of all faith is obviously here. This is a etching by Akiva Ken Sigan of Eli Wiesel, which um, shows the, our, our ongoing cooperation for our new book um, on the Holocaust literature or on Holocaust literature. And this is a passage from Daniel R. Schwarz on Wiesel's Night. In Night, we see dramatized the process of the narrator's developing into his role of ethical witness in the face of historical forces that would obliterate his humanity, his individuality, and his voice. Um, yeah, we need to be aware if we speak about a narrator here, or Daniel R. Schwarz speaks about a narrator. The narrator speaks about his own experience, this autobiographical experience. Yeah, three more. Levy, another, a uh, Wiesel, sorry. Now let's have a look at um, Levy. Um, if this is a man, one of his main wor works with a moral stamina and intellectual pose of a 20th century titan, the slightly built, unassuming chemist set out systematically to remember the German hell on earth, steadfastly to think it through, and then to re render it comprehensively. 
lucid, unpretentious prose. Um, Levy was brought from Italy in a, one of these cattle trains by the Nazis to Auschwitz, like so many others. And um, if this is a man uh, portrays the journey and his time in Auschwitz um, accurately. And here um, a passage from the work. At sunset, the siren of the firearm sounds the end of the work, and as we are all satiated at least for a few hours, no quarrels arise, we feel good, the couple feels no urge to beat us, and we are able to think of our mothers and wife. Um, um, this description of apparent normality is telling enough to the small um, um, through the small passage and the Kapos feels no urge to beat us. The painting again, the drawing is by Akiva Kenny Siegen and Daniel R. Schwarz is saying on the language is the protagonist in Levy's, Levy's books, the means, the means by which he seizes light from darkness um, for him, it is the means of creation and understanding to the antidote, the one antidote to chaos. Finally, uh, Imre Katis, Faithless, was the first English translation of a moving and disturbing novel about a Hungarian Jewish boy's experience in German death comes and his attempts to reconcile himself to those experience after the war. A short, short passage from this work, um, but neither stopbornness nor prayer nor any form of escape could have freed me from one thing, hunger. I had naturally felt, or at least supposed felt, I felt hunger before back at home. I had felt hungry at the brickyard, on the train, at Auschwitz, even at the Buchenwald, but I had never before had this sensation like this protractedly over a long haul, if I may put it that way. Um, again, the term novel is partly misleading here since um, Curtis uh, based his work on his own face. Um, the picture here um, presents um, Curtis when he receives the um, Literature Nobel Prize. Um, One more passage from this book. Um, this is almost the last sentence of the book. Yes, the next time I'm asked, I will write about the happiness of the concentration camp. Almost the last sentence of the book showing the fr fragility and brokenness of the young narrator. This is told the story from the perspective of a very innocent young man who cannot cope uh, with what's going or hardly doesn't have a chance to cope because he doesn't ex be, expect that people can be as evil as they are here, the Nazis in the concentration or death camp. A painting again by Akiva Kenny Siegen, um, inspired by a passage in Fateless. Um, and before I finish, I would like to present you one more work by Ernst Wiechert, Der Totenwald, Forest of the Dead, or Le Bois de Mort. This week has not been translated into German, um, so Akiva and I tried to translate, uh, sorry, had not been translated into English or French, so Akiva and I tried to translate one passage um, from it to give you an impression how this worked. Um, Wichert, as well, um, was in Buchenwald, he was never in Auschwitz. But in Buchenwald, and, um, uh, he speaks about the gallows and the presence of the gallows at one point where he's saying, what was most eye-catching at Buchenwald at roll calls was a wooden staircase leading to a gallows in the center of the camp. The execution platform had a wooden arm pointing menacingly over the barracks tormenting prisoners. 
that's a free adaptation of the German original. So this is a book which probably might be translated at one point by one of our translation study students into English or um, French or any other European or world language. Um, um, just let me finish on, um, on a personal note. Um, all these um, works from the concentration camps I presented here are autobiographical novels based on personal experience. Um, I'm having difficulties with um, pure fictional accounts of the Holocaust in a way I think it shows, it might even show it, uh, a certain kind of disrespect towards the victims. Um, of the Holocaust. It is significant that in the works of Levi Kertes, Riesel and Wichert, the Nazi murderers in the dead comes are nameless and um, don't have any qualities. And I, sh I think we ought to keep it that way since they don't deserve our attention unless we prosecute them for their crimes. Thank you very much. released. 
And some of them took then the chance to emigrate or to escape. Others didn't, and they then were killed. And they were what, sorry? Killed or murdered. Yeah. So in the, in the case of Stefan, yes. he, he was locked up, did you say, for a while? Or just questioned? He was just questioned. Oh, right. He's not like the character in his novel, where he, um, the character in his novel was um, locked up for a long time in chess. Thank you for both of your talks. I do have a question I may try to combine because um, it may concern both of your um, um, presentations, I hope at least, as I can make the frame. And um, for everyone interesting, Mark, was that you're saying that um, they are autobiographical uh, novels. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could even approach it from a more different angle in terms of seeing them as old fictional novels mm -hmm. because I would slightly disagree and say that in seeing them as literary accounts mm -hmm. you bring more justice to them than seeing them as only uh, as only so called autobiographical mm -hmm. novels and the reason is that way um, because lots of these authors are not so um, in a normative sense, the literary discourse. I mean, Anna Seger is a bit, you know, but most of them are so-called minority literature. They, I, a bit like Hans Fallada is maybe more likely like Anna Seger, but even still, they're not the common research interest in German literature. And I wonder if that is also, it's a very interesting mechanism, because if you compare to Ernst Jünger in Stahlwiesetzung, which is literally just, you know, like a recount of his diary, but it's like, Huge research and is often seen as like the big, you know, like account about war, uh, anti war writing. Um, whereas if it comes to so called minority authors, or like particular women, Jewish, and um, people of color, black authors, it often seems like the account of their lives devalues their own authorship, you know. So, therefore, I, would, I wonder if, you, if one could approach it from a different angle, mm -hmm. there would be more, you know, bringing that. Justice as seeing them as proper authors instead of, you know, devaluing them again in terms of oh that is only subjective account because it is your experience uh, because oh. in a way you know it's like and then I wondered and that's why I tried to like bring both of it together and Kiva you were like um, showing lots of these pictures I, as I understood they were like real people right they were like some kind of encountered and like. Um, fascism, murder, or, you know, like, resistance, murder, and whatsoever. And I wonder how much they, um, because you sometimes name them, how much the name is important here in order to bring them as subjects, you know, like, do you include their names on your works, or, and it's in a way, like, maybe a similar thing, what Mark said at the end of the presentation, some, some names are, um, some people, like, are sta staying main and staying remaining nameless because they are like racist whatsoever and the, the victims or the other is like changing the point and here I understood your work as well like bringing them like kind of justice maybe like a ring collection and so how much is this like important or how much is the importance of the name naming them in your work um, I actually personally I don't like using the term nameless and when I talk about people I've depicted in um, the uh, Wing series, um, whose names we don't know, as I tell audiences, everyone was born to a mother and father. Everyone was given a name at birth due to the happenstance of, of uh, the Nazi uh, genocides, was the dehumanization of uh, part of their process. And probably make parallels, let's say like in the Congo, five million people have died in the past, I don't know, 50 or so years in the war there. And I don't know any of them by name, or it's like they're not even a footnote in terms of people's uh, awareness of uh, genocide and such. But, um, so um, so the victims to me aren't nameless. This may sound like a linguistic distinction, but they aren't really nameless because they would have had names. We just don't know what their names were. I think in terms of the, the, the tent, 
let's say, uh, thinking of the six million Jewish people who were murdered and the 10 million murdered by the Nazis and fascists, uh, I think they say it's like at least a million, million and a half of those victims, they, the, their names aren't known. But anyway, um, that's just a, a distinction that I, I find important um, to point out. I don't know if that answered your question at all. It might be just a complete aside, but <laughs> that's some relevancy for me in my work in terms of the portrayals I do of people whose names are not known. So. Um, um, concerning the first part of your question, um, I just meant, meant it the other way. Um, I think because it's... Sorry, I, mean, I couldn't hear from that. What was the question exactly? Yeah, the question was that um, because it is the, that we wouldn't value the novels written by Cartes, um, Lichard, Lily, and um, 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 Wiesel, that I mean, the biographical novels. Because they, are, because they are written from a subjective perspective. But I don't think so. I, I think I would ri rather uh, rate them higher because there is a genuine, there is a, um, they are based on personal experience, so I rather than rate them rather higher. I have difficulties, for instance, with the film of uh, The Boy with the Strip, um, The Boy with the Strip Piano, Pajamas. I, I don't, the much, uh, whatever I would wish that the boy of the, the son of the commander would um, have the same faith as um, his friends, or uh, you probably hope that he would, you know, I don't, don't want to. Um, um, <laughs> explain myself. Um, don't want to put myself in an awkward position, but um, this is unreal. That this it wouldn't happen. I don't think that there is a possibility that something like this would happen. And um, so I have the same thinking on that. In that particular film, and we have a film by the Italian comic. Uh, oh, the the La Vie Belle, the Benigni. Yeah, yeah. Found it completely impossible uh, as a, um, in terms of the history as it was portrayed. Yeah, so the, so there is more reality if I read Fatalist by Cartes too, because I know he has had this experience. I just take it not just as a novel, I take it as a reality account, and so it, it hits me much harder than if somebody presents me something which might be true or not. That's why Schindler's List, for instance, has such an effect on me because I know that good was really such a barbarous murder and Nazi killer who appears in the film Schindler's List. So I was going to ask you a question, but in regard to that particular point, um, are you saying that really, if it is not based on uh, a personal experience or a graphical nature, that somehow you said it was disrespectful or distasteful if someone should write um, a novel about those years, that it would lack any, or wouldn't lack, would it be lacking in value, um, I, in I, a sense? In a way, it, I mean, I, yes, I, I find it a bit, I, I think I would have, I would not attempt this because I don't show, might, it might be, Disrespect towards the victims. I'm not sure about this position. It's a bit difficult. But it's interesting that you should say that because a lot of times people feel that they uh, can actually have a bigger impact on people by writing a fictional tale about circumstances in the past. People wouldn't necessarily read, or look, the vast majority of people wouldn't read um, an authentic historical um, uh, portrayal or whatever, but if they happen to come by it, by reading a, a very well written a thriller, a drama, etc., they will be it will have a massive effect on them. And they will be educated, as it were, by by so, so reading such a novel. Yes, and if, if somebody does it who has the experience, I take it even more um, um, serious. I can take it very seriously. While I have then difficulties if it's just if there is no background. Right. Background meaning like person, no personal experience. Yes, yes. But if they thoroughly research it, surely 
Yeah, I am. <laughs> or if it's based on transmission of memory, do they have the same to Yes. 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 Yeah. But that's a very interesting idea that after actually comes to the point of like aesthetics and you know like real encounter in general. But if you if you follow your argument, then it also that is also actually basically my point that obviously a lot of literature is being devalued by using the term autobiographical. And if you look at them, they are basically so-called minority authors, whereas other authors, which are men and white, using this term and obviously pushing you know the literature as a positive thing because it is encountered as long as you white into men as a positive, you know, that as in, is enough to actually push your literature as being literary, aesthetic, and interesting, whereas other authors, which don't fit in this category, using the same category, is in order to be, to be valued because it has reduced them mm -hmm. to only subjective account and accounts. Okay. It is from, instead of using them from an aesthetic perspective. Okay. And what I would say then, if you, for example, look at Thomas Mann Zauberberg, mm -hmm. no one would ever say this is like a so-called uh, autobiographical novel, but I mean, how that's like very much comes into the question of how much authors are influenced by reality, by their accounts and whatsoever, and what we mark as subjective or not. Mm -hmm. So that was like more my... Okay, I see the point here. Mm -hmm. uh, the question I was going to ask you, though, just mentioning a recent... Uh, uh, book talk by somebody who decided, because they had uh, met with many people who had suffered during the minor strike, and took absolutely great pains to ensure that every piece of information in that was, was true to life, but made, uh, made a, you know, a fictional story of it, which will then enable people to fully understand the, the suffering of people during the minor strike. So that's... I see your point. I mean, um, Cantes and Visa won Nobel Prizes for their works. They never say it's my autobiography. It's, they are, they um, pronounce it as uh, fictional works, so it's so far. I was uh, wondering about, you mentioned that the, the Nazis had, had plans for a museum of the extinct Jewish race. Had they actually gathered lots of uh, objects? Had they a building? I think I think there was the situation? There, were, there was at least 100,000 items stored in, I believe, six warehouses in Prague. I don't know if they're still stored there or not. It was um, everything from um, various religious um, well, books and um, prayer shawls and, and lamps and uh, a whole lot of the, the uh, Bohemia and Moravia, the Czech Jewish population was fairly well off, let's say, compared to Jews in Lithuania and Poland and elsewhere. So they, they had this, actually, I, that's a good question. I don't know what's happened to all of it. A small fraction of it was published in a book called The Precious Legacy back in the 19th. Sorry, what was published then? The oh, objects, the nature of the yeah, objects. Yeah, photographs of the, and they, they toured some museums and art galleries, including New York's Jewish Museum. Precious Legacy um, was authored by who? Uh, I forget who the editor was. Um, and uh, so, if, yeah, if you can get a copy of the book, perhaps from your local library or something, uh, um, there are like several hundred items in the book. Um, so, I don't know the answer to the question as to what's happened to all of these um, items since then. Um, I wanted to respond to what you said. Um, if I understand where you're saying that you don't think that there's uh, much validity to writers writing about the same experience like being in a Nazi concentration death camp or extermination camp uh, written by people who didn't experience it, is that correct? That's probably a this, um, it's, it's, no, no, I wouldn't say this, but um, yeah, I've, from a moral point of view, I'm having difficulty of this because you know, yeah. you, 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 you <laughs> put yourself in a position of somebody who suffered a lot yeah. uh, and you sit there at your desk and allow yourself to write about it. Right. Um, is this... Nonetheless, I'm in a group, all arts people together. <laughs> Visual artists like myself, I'm now my 26 year on the end of the series. Yeah. The first topic started. This one was in 1976. Okay. 
So, um, and then, you know, there are like dancer choreographers who've done work, so there's okay. filmmakers. Steven Spielberg is probably my yep, age. Yep, he yep. was born after World War II. Yes, that's right. Um, um, other theater playwrights and so on. Um, Perhaps it's I, I find it important and beyond yeah. meaningful that people who, and non, there's a non-Jewish artist in his 80s now, a painter who wrote me some years ago in England, who did a whole series of Holocaust portrait paintings. Um, but actually, he was alive. He was probably a child during the war years. But I, I wouldn't want to negate any of this. Okay. Um, because I, I think it's one way um, to continue education on it, especially as the Holocaust denial community is, is growing leaps and bounds day by day, year by year. Um, if, I, if you go to Google, bring up that uh, photograph taken um, uh, in the barracks after liberation of Buchenwald, that's Elie Wiesel peering out, just standing with all the other inmates there. Do a Google search for that image. The first two listings, the last few times I looked, were from um, professional Holocaust denial Jew aid organizations in the United States, and several more show up on the same list just in the first page alone. And I find that itself, well, some of which you have seen and uh, reprehensible beyond words. Um, and some of these sites are extremely sophisticated and well designed. So, um, so if, if, you know, if a 20 year old art student now or a 20 year old music student wants to do a piece about the Holocaust, I say more power to him or her, let him go for it. Okay. Even without, you know, or okay. writing a whatever it might be, a novella or whatever. Okay, probably I, I didn't have, didn't read the right stuff, I didn't see the right film so far that I, that I would be convinced about it. I mean, uh, when I read Cartes, Liesel or so, it, um, it's so horrible that I immediately can't see the value of it. When I see things, when I see your pictures, your paintings, uh, it convinces me. Um, when I see stuff like the, the boy in the, in the, the strip, striped pajamas, I'm having difficulties to uh, well, to have the same. That's another problem, Chris. We may not always like what someone's doing interpretively yeah. about these events from 60, right. 70 years ago. Yeah, yeah that's right. The last one we've got, then we'll ask the second question. Um, I'm sure it's, it's, it's basically your extreme sensitivity as to avoid the possibility of anybody um, from the Jewish community suffering any kind of adverse you know, reaction that makes, perhaps pushes you in the direction you're following with regards to that. I imagine that is probably uh, the back of your, back of your mind, what is actually causing it. I'd be interested to know, because uh, actually having seen the, the, the film uh, Stripes Pajamas, I think it is accessible to a child, that, and okay, this is unusual that one could actually take a child to such a film, and then there would be the massive impact at the end, which one would not actually happen in a normal course of events. So I think I thought it was extremely effective, but that's just my, my, my sister showed it, the film to her kids, so insofar uh, you might be right in this mm. respect. Yeah. But um, with regard to, I, 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 if you could go into a bit more detail, I'm quite surprised to hear that um, you mentioned that there's a Holocaust denial industry or whatever in the USA. Could you go into a bit more detail about that? My question before uh, was, you had mentioned the Holocaust Museum in the USA. Did you say that it had a register of the selling shit that sent me? I don't quite know what you were I, I going into with the, the United States Memorial Museum has been um, doing research. I don't, I don't know if it's completed yet to, to um, document the history of every Jewish passenger who was on the St. Louis ship and in terms of finding out um, which ones survived, which ones were murdered. Um, so um, that might be fairly easy to find out in the writing, um, sending an inquiry letter to the uh, museum via their website, which I didn't have time to do myself before I left on this trip. So. Sorry, but can I just collect any other questions just to sort of finish up? Or anybody else want to ask anything? We'll be down to the wide reception, but before we'll just finish it. Okay. All right, so there's another question. No, it's a fact when I asked about the 
what, what is the extent, so what is actually going on in the, in the States with regard to, you're saying that there are lots of people who are denying the Holocaust, oh, so it's going to go into a bit more it's detail. worldwide in Western countries, you can find it in, I'm sure, South America, in Britain, Europe, everywhere else, or Russia, and so on. Um, well, um, there are numerous Holocaust denial and um, uh, incredibly poisonous, disgusting, ugly websites um, uh, vilifying Jewish people uh, with imagery and graphics that just makes me want to throw up, excuse uh, directness. So when I come across them, sometimes by accident, some of them are well known, like David Duke, who ran for Senate in the last election, former Klan member. Articles like in The Guardian and Independent Online always point out that he's a former Klan, Ku Klux Klan leader, but his work in recent years has, has put all that behind his whole um, entire um, operation in recent years is professional Jew, Jewish hatred and Holocaust denial. That's entirely what his website is focused on. He's only one. There's another, uh, the, the oldest and most successful Holocaust now group in the United States is called the Institute for Historical Revision. And they'll show up in all manner of searches like in Google or Yahoo search engines for things imagery, photographs, whatever, text regarding World War II, there, that website, another one called elliemiseltattoo.com. Um, they, they just filled with, they're, they're really well designed. Um, in terms of graphic design, they're all footnoted and annotated to make them look professional. So like, you know, a 15-year-old pupil, or college student will see the site and they'll think this is completely legitimate, which is why I'm just horrified at the and there's so many more of them. And they're not just in the United States, as I say. Canada, I'm sure there's some in Britain as well, and around Europe. Uh, of course, there's been some infamous uh, or famous uh, incidences of Holocaust denial out of Canada, Britain, United States. Uh, well, there is the a film with yeah. Rachel Weiss on David Irving. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Denial. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. chapter tomorrow morning at half past ten, last chance to see it. Uh -huh. Those chapters to see. Oh, okay. Those slides, if there's any chance to. That's right. Maybe we can erase. My slides? Yes, to actually see.